Hello. Today I would like to tell you the tale of Orchard Place, London's lost village. The Romans were London's first settlers. They are believed to have farmed oysters along the Thames back when there were very few inhabitants here. By the 16th century, a marshy outcrop on the Thames east of London had become known as Orchard House. Soon, industries began to settle here. A copperus works arrived during the 17th century. Copperus was used in dye and for products like iron gall ink and fixative for wool. Mather & Co. boiled whale blubber here from the 18th century. After killing a whale, enormous iron cauldrons were used to render the blubber, creating soap and margarine. In 1803, the Corporation of Trinity House, the authority for lighthouses in England, set up a depot here. Located at what became known as Trinity Boy Wharf, Trinity House stored and maintained chains and buoys used to navigate mariners to safe travel. There was also a lighthouse, but it was never used as navigational aid. It was the place where Michael Faraday, scientific advisor to Trinity House for several decades, conducted optical experiments. It was also used to train lighthouse keepers. To join the lighthouse service, a man must have been British, aged 19 to 28, completed military service and must be single only being allowed to marry after four years' service. Three years later, the East India docks opened. Here arrived goods from across the British Empire and beyond, including spices, indigo, carpets, silk and tea. Animals, including the occasional elephant, also arrived off the ships. A variety of different maritime industries grew around the docks and the wharf. Along the river could be seen lighters, small barges used to unload a ship's cargo and take it ashore. Many decided to build ships here. The Gaslight and Coke Company even tried building with the tar they produced locally. The hideous smell made this an unpopular and short-lived experiment. We also saw the Thames Plate Glass Company set up at what was now known as Orchard Place. They built the biggest plates of glass in England, some of which were shown at the Great Exhibition in 1851. At their peak, they employed around 75% of the locals. The Thames Ironworks were another big local employer. They and their predecessors pioneered the move from wood to iron in shipbuilding producing magnificent boats, including HMS Warrior and HMS Thunderer. There were many recreational opportunities for employees, with musical societies and sports clubs, one of which went on to become West Ham United. Although the shipbuilders, factory workers and dockers were bringing in a massive revenue, they lived on precarious wages. Strikes to improve conditions and pay were common. The growth of industry brought a new community of people, but few amenities. Locals had to travel along the long and lonely Lemoth Road to Poplar for most errands. A hundred identical houses lined the streets of Orchard Place, two up, two down, scullery, washroom and toilet out back. The community stuck together, with characters on every street. Mrs Esther Woods, the baby lady, delivered newborns. The local mother figure, with no medical training, who had a remedy for all ills. Life was tough at Orchard Place. A death in the family was devastating. If it was a breadwinner... Relief officers told you to sell all personal possessions, leaving only a table, chair and beds. People needed relief. They would head down the Causey on Saturday nights, waving to passing pleasure boats on their way to Southend. 
Some would even swim alongside the barges, ignoring the filth, the rats and the danger of death. Many would fish as well. A fisherman sold shrimp from his home at Number One Creekside. However, this thriving business wasn't to last. The shores of the peninsula were also a place for toshing. Locals would scour for objects washed up on the foreshore to keep or to sell. Another way the locals could earn a few bob was taking objects to the pawn shop. There was often stigma and shame in pawning objects, so people often gave someone a few pennies to do the job for you. It was common for children to help families by jobbing after school or bunking off to earn a few extra coppers. This included scurfing, crawling into ship's boilers to clean them out. Days at Bow Creek School started with a prayer. Mr Haywood would then call a handkerchief parade. Everyone had to wave their hankies, a compulsory object for students, in the air or just an old rag for the poorer ones. Illness was rife among the students. In 1915, outbreaks of German measles, scarlet fever, diphtheria, chickenpox, scabies, tuberculosis, impetigo and influenza brought the school to a standstill. Many children died. The proximity of the school to the river was another threat to children's lives. There was also a school for adults set up by Charles Truman. The people of Orchard Place could learn new skills in reading, writing, crafts and the especially popular country dancing. Occasionally, excursions took place. Every year, one Lord Hatfield would invite children of school age down to his estate where they would play in the grounds and admire the land. They also got to visit Greenwich Park and the Tower of London. Families would make an annual exodus to the fields of Kent to help pick hops for three weeks or so. At Christmas time, the local factories would make a collection to give to schoolchildren. Long tables, a top with homemade cakes, Sparkling lemonade and jelly in all different shapes and sizes were laid out in the school hall to cries of delight. Not many of the locals went to church, much to the consternation of the local priest, who frequently condemned the residents of Orchard Place in the parish magazine. Outsiders viewed the area with extreme prejudice. One clergyman commented that the inhabitants are hardly human, incarnate mushrooms, adding that God must have made a mistake in creating them. In 1928, Orchard Place was hit by a devastating flood, from which it never recovered. It was soon declared a slum by the authorities, and by 1936 almost all residents had been cleared out. Today, there is little left to remind us of the thriving community that once existed here, where terraced houses and factories sat side by side.